Well, let's get right to the point here. Let's talk about uh, why do we need a balanced budget amendment? Uh, what kind of mess are we in? Nobody's mentioned yet uh, that uh, our national debt is $18 trillion uh, already. That's bigger than our entire economy, which is $17 trillion. So we now uh, already uh, spent a whole year's worth of, uh, we have enough debt uh, equal to a whole year's worth of uh, income. Uh, but that national debt, most people don't know, doesn't cover everything we know, everything we owe. It doesn't cover, uh, it, it doesn't cover military pensions. So all the, uh, the unfunded liabilities and military pensions are not covered, not counted as part of the national debt. It doesn't cover veterans' benefits, so all the uh, unfunded liabilities we owe in veterans' benefits are not covered. Of course, it doesn't cover state and local debt. We owe another three, four trillion dollars in state and local debt. Uh, it doesn't cover our unfunded pension liabilities of state and local governments. Uh, it doesn't cover the unfunded liabilities of our uh, big entitlement programs. So all the unfunded liabilities of Social Security are not covered in that national debt. All the unfunded liabilities of Medicare are not covered in that national debt. Lawrence Kotlikoff, a professor at Boston University, uh, did a calculation, has done a calculation of everything we owe. All the unfunded liabilities, all the debts, federal, state, and local, it adds up $210 trillion. That's the, that's the, the economically valid estimate of everything we owe, $210 trillion. So 210 trillion divided by 17. So it's uh, uh, it's uh, 20. So it's uh, 10 times. We owe more than 10 times our entire national income every year. We actually already incurred enough debt, so we owe uh, 10 times uh, our national income. So so we have these efforts that have been going on for years to create a balanced budget amendment, as uh, was the forerunner of this entire uh, effort, the balanced budget amendment task force. Actually. Uh, got going in 1979. It was over 1979-1980 you had this effort to get the states to adopt, adopt these resolutions to call a convention to consider a balanced budget amendment. Uh, and actually one of the fascinating things about that, we didn't get a balanced budget amendment, but every state organizing to pass one of these resolutions became a state organized right away for the Reagan campaign that came along in 1980. So this was a big boost in the presidential right election to uh, Ronald Reagan that all these grassroots efforts in all these states have already been organized to pass these balanced budget the amendments. And uh, hopefully uh, this will uh, promote the further liberation of America in the next election, all these efforts among the states to, uh, uh, yeah, to pass these, uh, to, to pass these a call for these Article 5 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so then, uh, so that's one of the, I like to think of it as three basic courses out there. There's this whole balanced budget amendment task force that is seven states short of having enough to actually force a convention on a balanced budget amendment. We have the Dick Drainis' Compact for America, which is another effort, a whole new, different approach. And we have this uh, convention of the states, which has really gotten its biggest boost by Mark Levin and his book, The Liberty Amendments. Uh, and in fact, so they go well beyond the whole idea of a balanced budget amendment in the Liberty Amendments. So they're trying to develop counterweights to a runaway federal government and new checks and balances to limit the uh, power of the federal government. So there's a whole big issue, a whole big area in corralling the excessive delegation of regulatory authority that Congress has engaged in. And we see one of the advantages of back Barack Obama is he shows all the weaknesses in our current federal framework. So. Uh, that when Congress refused to adopt the cap and trade legislation that he wanted, he said, well, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Interesting choice of words. And so he's gone ahead and he says, I'm going to have EPA uh, commit national economic suicide. Uh, 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 and he doesn't need to ask anybody's permission. He has these people work for him, and he tells them what to do, and they're going out. And so now we see this uh, clean power plan coming along, telling the states, uh, each, for the EPA is telling the states, you now each must decide. You must, you know, drive the, the knife committing economic suicide for your state. You must, you the state must do it. Under this clean power plan, each, either they give the state a period of time to propose their own plan to destroy their state economies. Uh, and so this is regulation run them up. Even when there was two-thirds supermajorities in the Congress that were Democrat, uh, Barack Obama couldn't get them to adopt this kind of uh, national economic suicide. So now he says, I'll just have the EPA issue a rule telling the states each one of you have to do it. And, 
And so, obviously, we've given up too much, the Congress has delegated too much of its power to these federal regulatory agencies. These federal regulatory agencies are actually writing the law. When the Constitution says the laws are to be written by Congress, and so one of the things that needs to be done that the, uh, the Convention of States might address is the success of delegation of power in all these regulatory authorities. So Congress should have to approve regulation before it becomes law. And you can put some limitations on it. You can say a certain number of congressmen have to sign a, 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 a petition to get a vote, or you can say it, it's going to cost a certain amount of money. It, but you cannot have these bureaucrats unelected, unaccountable, not subject to anything, and everybody can say, you know, Barack Obama, oh, that wasn't me, that was the EPA that did this to you. And uh, so uh, we need to have this authority, well, excessive delegation authority, corralled back into the states as a new counter to runaway federal power. And in Mark Levin's book, which uh, I found fascinating, he, he proposes new realms of authority for the states as a counterweight to the federal government. So he proposes an amendment where the states can actually veto federal legislation. Think of what would have happened to Obamacare if states could veto, could say veto federal legislation. Oh, you got this through the House, you got this through the Senate. One time you had a chance to do that when you had enough power. And uh, uh, and the, the public hates it. And so if, there, if the states had a power to veto a runaway federal legislation, then, uh, uh, then that would have been taken care of already by now. And similar for things like, uh, uh, for other uh, uh, Obama administration abuses. So the bottom line is the founders included uh, this power in the, in the Constitution as a way to stop a runaway federal government. They saw this as an additional backstop. And we should not be shy of using this. This was the foresight the founders had as to what was necessary to corral runaway federal power. And we have you know, at least three movements going on today. Uh, and uh, let them all compete to see who gets to the finish line first. But uh, this is a very worthy uh, uh, effort and something that's badly needed if we are really going to have control our federal, our federal government the way it was originally intended to be limited. Well, this, is, this is the uh, only means of, of doing that. So I want to keep us on track in time. So uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions people have when the time's appropriate. Thank you.